My name is Ali al Karaguli. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. And in this video, I'm going to explain to you the beauty behind Euler's equation. As we can see over here, there's this equation. You may have seen it before in mathematics. You may have seen it in some of electrical engineering classes, or you may have just heard of it. And in this video, I'm going to explain why it's beautiful, why this form is actually not the most beautiful form. This is kind of a mathematician's, an amateur mathematician's beautiful equation. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. And instead, I'm going to write the equation where this comes from and show the true beauty behind it and show an engineer's perspective on what makes something really, really beautiful. So before I go ahead and dive into that, again, I'm just going to give you a quick roadmap. By the end of this video, you're going to not only understand this specific form of Euler's equation, you're going to understand Euler's identity in general, and you're going to understand the relationship between exponential functions and circles. Because that's what, at the end of the day, what Euler's uh, equation is all about. It's all about relating exponential functions and using exponential functions with imaginary numbers to be able to describe circular and oscillatory behavior. So before I show you why this equation is beautiful, let me actually write the equation in which this comes from, which is e to the j theta equals cosine theta plus j sine theta. And this equation right here, to me as an engineer, is a million times more beautiful than this one. Because the reason this is perceived as beautiful is because it has five constants. It has like an exponential uh, term e, which is like 2.71828. This is a constant, it's a value. We have i, or j. Uh, electrical engineers usually use the term j because i is reserved for currents. So for the rest of the video, I'm going to say j. Please don't be confused. That's just basically referring to the imaginary number. And then there's pi, which is like 3.14 something, 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 which relates to the circumference of the circle, to its diameter. Then we have 1, and we have 0. So we have five constants basically representing uh, an equation. And it kind of looks cool. It looks, it looks beautiful. It looks pretty to look at. But in my opinion, this is a very superficial way to think about math. This is for people who only like no numbers uh, on a chalkboard. I'm going to now, for the rest of the video, and, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove this to you. This is not the only equation. Um, that looks like that because this equation is only a special form of this equation and I can prove that to you because if we draw a table of e to the j Theta and for theta we represent different values of pi. So let's say at 0 at pi over 2 at pi at 3 pi over 2 and then at 2 pi What we're going to notice is if we plug in a 0 for the theta over here We're going to get cosine 0 plus j sine of 0. So there's going to be a 1 plus 0 so this is just going to be a 1. And then at pi over 2, this is just going to be a j, because this guy is going to go to 0. This guy is going to go to 1. Here at pi, which is one, uh, which is true for this equation, is going to be negative 1. And again, this can be rewritten by just moving the 1 to the other side as equals minus 1. And then at 3 pi over 2, it's minus j. And then at 2 pi, we're back to 0. And if you think about it, all we're doing here is we're just going in a circle, right? So we're basically saying that at angle 0, we have a value of 1. At angle 90 degrees, or pi over 2, we have a j, or an i. And at 180 degrees, or pi, we have a minus 1. And then at 270 degrees, or 3 pi over 2, we have a minus j. And then at 2 pi, once we've completed the full circle, we are back to the 1, right? Um, and I'm sorry, this should be a 1 over here. So this is basically all we're doing with this equation. But, but again, the behavior here is coming from this equation. Again, that beautiful 2D equation was just one special form. It was just like what happens over here when you throw in a pi. So again, e to the j pi equals minus 1. And again, if we plug in another number, like, I don't know, e to the j pi over 2, that's just going to give us an i or a j, right? So again, I, I don't really think there's anything special going on here. The real special thing is the question of, how the hell is this exponential function, e raised to some term, giving us sines and cosines? Because these are oscillatory terms. These are terms, these are sinusoidal terms. And this is something associated with sinusoidal and circular behavior. And why the hell is this equation going in a circle when it has an exponential term or, or an exponential function? Why are, why are we going in a circle as we keep going on? To me, that is the real beauty. And I'm going to go ahead and explain to you uh, why that happens. So before we first understand that, we need to take the exponential function and we need to break it down into its first principles. And this is another, this is a good way and a very good physics slash engineering way to understand things. If you don't understand something, try to break it down to as many small parts as possible and then see how they fit together and then see if you can learn something. So in order for us to do that, we're going to start with the exponential function e to the x 
And then we're going to use our good old friend, the Taylor series expansion, to break it down into its very, very, very tiny pieces and then add them together and see what that actually looks like. Now again, all the Taylor expansion series is, is just a function, it's kind of like a hammer that breaks things down into like very, very small part, infinitesimally small parts, um, and then it puts them together, kind of like a hammer and a glue. Uh, and it was of course invented by Taylor Swift. Of course, that part is a joke. But basically, we can t uh, rewrite this e to the x as a summation from n equals zero to infinity is basically saying we're going to break it down to infinitesimally small parts from the beginning of the function all the way to its, to, to, to its very, final, very final piece in eternity. And that can be rewritten as x to the n over n factorial. And don't be, afraid, don't be scared by this n factorial. Factorial is just basically saying you take a number and you multiply it by the ones before it until you reach the beginning of the integers. So I don't know, like 3 factorial is equal to just like 3 times 2 times 1. And you stop at 1 because that's the first number. And I don't know, like 4 factorial is just like 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So again, this is just a, basically a, a mathematical way of representing the number multiplied by a bunch of numbers before it. So this right here, e to the x, can be rewritten as the summation of, the, of, of, of each part, of, of many parts, where each part looks like this. I'm going to prove this to you. We're going to take a special case of e, where x is equals to 1, because we know what that number. We know that we, we made a previous video on the number e, and we know what the value of it is. So if we plug in a, a 1 for x here, we're going to have e to the 1. We're going to have the summation of n equals 0 raised to infinity. So if we plug in a 1 for x, that's just going to be 1 to the n, that's going to be a 1 over n factorial. So if we start plugging in n terms and add them, because that's basically what the series is, that's why, um, uh, uh, that's, that's why it's a summation, we're going to first do 0. So 0 factorial is 1, so 1 over 1 is 1, and then 1 over n, uh, n factorial, when the value is 1, is again 1 plus 1, and then when it's 2, it's 1 over 2, or really it's like 2 times 1, but then it's pretty much just 2. And then after that, 1 over 3 factorial, which is 3 times 2 times 1, so it's 1 over 6. And if we keep adding on those small terms, and we, and, and we, and we start noticing this is just 1 plus 1 equals 2. 2 plus 0.5 is 2. So again, this is just like 1 plus 1 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.16 and so on, and then a bunch of other terms. If you add these guys together, 1 plus 1 plus 0.5 plus 0.5, blah, 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 eventually, you're going to get to 2.71828. Okay? I don't know if you can see that. Yes, you can see it. Okay, cool. So again, all we've done here is we've just taken the Taylor series expansion. Basically, we broke down this e to the x to like many, many terms. And we've looked at a special case where x equals 1. And we saw that the Taylor series checks that this e to the 1 ends up equaling 2.71828, which we know that to be true. So now let's go ahead and, and break down the Taylor series expansion for the function e to the x without like having a special case. And let's see what the terms look like. So again, I'm just going to start writing them down. I'm going I'm to use, I don't know, maybe should I use a different color just to make life easier? Let's use this yellow over here. So we got e to the x equals, again, x to the n. Um, so, so I'm going to start plugging in numbers for n. So for n equals 0, x to the 0 is just um, 1 over n factorial. That's just 1. And then I plug in a 1. So x to the, to the 1 is just x uh, over n factorial. That's x over 1. That's just x. And then I plug in a 2 for n's over here. So x squared over um, 2 factorial, x to the third over 3 factorial, x to the 4th, over 4 factorial, and then yes, we still have room, x to the 5th, over 5 factorial, and so on, and you keep adding them. So these terms, so again, e to the x can be broken down into like 1 plus x, plus x squared over 2 factorial, and, whatnot, and so on. And again, don't be phased by this 2 factorial, this is just 1 times 2, so this is 2. This is 3 times 2 times 1, which is 6, and so on. We're going to keep it as its factorial form, just because it's a bit cleaner to look at. And now, okay, we see that the Taylor series expansion of e to the x is, can be broken down by these parts, which kind of makes sense. They're all positive terms, and they're all converging towards something. So that kind of makes sense in terms of our exponential function. But now, what happens if instead of this x, we replace it with something a lot more interesting, such as e to the j theta? 
So again, we're not doing we're not we're not changing much. All we're doing is we're taking this x and we're changing the variable to j theta. Because again, we're trying to understand why does an exponential function turn into a circle or turn into an oscillation, right? That's kind of the question we're trying to answer. So then we go ahead and plug everything the same. But instead of the x, now we do the j theta. So we have one instead of an x, it's gonna be a j theta over here. And here is gonna be j squared um, or j theta squared over two factorial, um, j theta cubed, the whole thing, over three factorial. And we just rewrite that again, j, th j theta to the fourth, four factorial, j theta to the fifth, over five factorial. And again, if you're like, I don't want you to get too lost in the math. What we're trying to do here is we're, tr we're, we're still, we're just trying, we're, we're seeing that this e to the j theta is just a function that can be broken down by a bunch of terms. And you're going to see why we're doing this, because this is going to end up being something very, very cool and mind blowing. So I'm going to go ahead and do it over here. So I'm going to erase this. And we're going to rewrite this e to the j theta over here based on just re 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 rearranging some of the numbers. For example, we have j squared theta. We have um, uh, j cubed theta j to the fourth theta, and we want to write this, we want to simplify this a bit. We want to write it in a, in a function, in a way that is a lot simpler and more elegant. So we know that j is just equals j. We know that if we square the j, and we end up with minus one. We know that if we cube the j, we end up with minus j. And then we know that if we do j to the fourth, that's just j squared, which is minus one squared, which ends up being a one. So we can actually rewrite some of these terms in a simpler way based on this um, uh, representation of j. So I'm just going to rewrite this as e to the j theta 1 plus j theta. And then over here, I have a j squared. And I know that j squared is just basically a minus 1. So it's going to be a minus theta squared over 2 factorial. Okay. Then here I have j cubed, and I know that that's just a minus j, minus theta cubed over 3 factorial. And then I have a plus here because I know j to the fourth is just basically a 1 again. So theta to the fourth over 4 factorial. And then finally, can you see that? Yep, you can see that. j, um, and then to the fifth. So basically we factor out um, the, the 4, which is a 1, and then we end up with a minus, um, we, we end up with a j again. So it's going to be a j theta to the fifth over 5 factorial. Now here's where I want you to already start seeing something interesting happen, is by rewriting it like this, we've seen that for e to the x, all the terms are positive, and because there's no, the, the, there is no alternating. However, when we plugged in the j theta, when we, when we started using the imaginary component, something very interesting happened. We start with a plus 1, and then we go to a j, and then we go to a minus 1, and then here we go to a minus j, should be a, a j in here, and then we go back to a plus 1, and then a plus j, and then a minus 1, and then a minus j, and so on. So we already start seeing that the behavior of each term, when we break it down using the Taylor series, starts alternating which is basically our good old friend, the circle. So we start with 1, we go to a j, minus 1, minus j, and so on. All these terms um, keep repeating in a circle. So we kind of already start seeing an intuition of how, wow, when you break down, when, by throwing in the j and you start breaking it down, the terms already start showing you an oscill oscillatory beh behavior. But then here's where it gets even more mind-blowing. If we take all the terms without a j, well, this includes the minus, so this guy, this guy, and this guy. And then we take all the terms over here with the j. Let's say this is in green. Uh, yep, this has a j. So over here. So as you can see, we have three green boxes, and then we have three red boxes. Basically, these are just the terms that are uh, have only a real component. Th these are the terms with a j, so they have the imaginary number. And if we take these guys and add them together, it's just j theta minus theta cubed over 3 factorial plus j theta to the fifth over 5 factorial, and so on. We notice that this is actually the Taylor expansion of a sine function if we factor out the j. 
So the pi, I'm sorry, the theta minus uh, theta cubed to the th uh, third um, minus uh, plus theta to the fifth over five factorial. If we take out the j, that is just the Taylor expansion of a sine function, sine of theta. And then likewise, same thing for the terms over here. If we take a look at this first term, this second term, this third term, and we rewrite them as one minus theta squared over two factorial plus theta to the fourth, four factorial, and so on, we add those terms. Guess what? That is the Taylor series expansion of a cosine function, which is mind blowing because then we can basically rewrite this whole thing as e to the j theta is equals to the combination of cosine theta and then factoring out the j sine theta. And it's, it's like we've just done a magic trick. It's just crazy. By simply breaking it down to its components, figuring out that there are some components that belong only to the sine, some components that only belong to the cosine, we realize that this exponential function, by using imaginary components in the exponent, starts behaving like an oscillation and starts behaving like a circle and can be represented by a sine and a cosine. And to me, this is really, really crazy. To me, this is really, really beautiful. This is, this is what real beauty is. Beauty is not just looking at an equation and saying, oh, it has a bunch of constants and it looks really, really cool. Beauty is being able to take a function that is crazy and exponential and then by using something like an imaginary number, be able to derive terms that can be then put together to describe oscillations. And to me, that's just like, that's just unbelievable. That's just amazing. I hope you find it nearly as satisfying as I do because that's how Euler uh, found it probably when he discovered it. I believe it was like 1748. This dude was chilling in St. Petersburg and he was just like doing a bunch of stuff. And I'm willing to bet the first time he looked at this, he was like, wow, like he felt something, you know? So I hope you feel something. That being said, we've kind of wrapped up all the mathematical requirements to understanding more advanced topics such as the Fourier transforms. So I believe the ne ne next we are ready to move on to things such as the Fourier transforms um, because now we understand exponentials, we understand oscillations, we understand Euler's equation, uh, we understand some crazy math. So yeah, let me know what you thought of this in the comments whether um, some parts are still unclear or some things you still need uh, more clarifications on. And yeah, with that, I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace, love.